Welcome everyone to the first module of the ResNet Lab on tour program. Uh, this is the first of many modules and I'm really excited to welcome you all to this program that we have been developing for over a year. Uh, in this first module, uh, you'll get to know a little bit more about what the program is about and like what, what it is in for you. Uh, and then I'll make a quick introduction, like a, a motivation on why the Web2 architecture has some design flaws that need to be improved upon. And uh, I'll tell you about like what IPFS is, how it contributes to it. And then uh, I'll tell you about like what is the Web3 revolution. So uh, for those of you wondering, like, so this program, the Resonant Hub on Tour program, it is something we created a, a year and a half ago uh, as a bridge um, to the decentralized web research. So our purpose was to create a program to basically uh, train all sorts of hackers, scientists, researchers, um, and make an invite to the research community to think about the new challenges on the Web3 that are real, very real, right? So like, there's a lot of things happening on the Web3 that is getting deployed every day. And uh, there's a lot of new research that is getting uh, like speeding through from the research pipeline uh, to the prototype to the actual machines. And so the, the challenges are more and more interesting and the feedback loop is very uh, real as well, which makes it very exciting. So uh, as we created this program, first we decided to take uh, uh, the on tour version where we went to a multitude event of events from multiple events to um, NGN events to even other uh, conferences. Um, and we were able through this to uh, reach out to over 5,000 academics uh, through like just direct participation in events and or recordings of the, the, the talks that we delivered. And from this, we got a lot of feedback. So we, we got a chance to improve our materials and, and to improve our explanations of how IPFS works and how the protocols that built on top of IPFS work. Um, and so this is the ResNet on tour uh on demand edition uh, and so we are basically giving everyone uh, in the world uh, unlimited free access to all the content and it starts with what we call the five core modules that like welcome everyone into what is the web3 and how does ipfs like peer peer uh work uh, how does content addressing work and then we'll have over eight elective modules of let's call it specialization so that people can um, decide to watch or not uh, if they are interested and we'll be releasing these over time. And so as I said, the core modules are really designed to equip you with everything you need to understand. Content addressing, content routing, exchange of content, and mutable content. Um, if you are an event organizer, a meetup organizer, a conference organizer, or a lecturer, if you are interested in bringing all these materials to your uh, local community, to your class, uh, please feel empowered to take them away. Uh, we are making the videos and the, the slide decks available to everyone. And if you need any help, just let us know. We are more than happy to help you uh, delivering this content to others. So let's get into like, what is the Web2 challenges? And so the Web2.0 uh, is very familiar to all of us. Like we, we use it every day um, and we use it to communicate to our friends, to our loved ones, to run our businesses, to acquire new knowledge. But like um, one thing that we also know very well is that like the slightest uh, failure uh, on uh, the backbone or on the access to the internet and all of those applications that we learn to rely on just fail on us. Um, and there is a reason why this happens. And it comes from a, a design decision that made sense uh, a few decades ago because it was the simplest um, but it, it comes with its own compromises and that is location addressing so location addressing basically says that like i have a pointer to a, a piece of content that is located somewhere but if the path to that content is broken by some reason maybe internet blackout like some router router fails uh, one of the ocean cable fails now i'm not able to access that backend that machine that has the content and therefore i'm unable to consume the content the problem comes like that yes if the content is indeed on the other side you cannot access it but like a lot of times actually actually even when these situations happen the content is already within your region and so the content might be in some user other user machine but like you simply cannot access it because the the discovery mechanism is not designed to enable you to access it. Um, and worse, 
uh, you actually might even have access to the content in your local machine already, but um, because you don't have any way to verify that the copy that you have locally is the one that you're looking for, there is no way to validate its integrity. You simply, like your browser will give you like a 404 that we are all very familiar with. Um, and, and worse, like what this also creates is that like, because we always need to go to the backbone, we keep applying a lot of pressure in the wire for transferring the same bits. So if you have a neighborhood, like a city, downloading the same YouTube file, uh, the same YouTube video, they will literally be downloading the same bits from the same server over and over and over again, rather than sharing. And, and this is not the only problem, um, or the only two problems with location addressing. There are many others, uh, like applications don't work when they are disconnected, usually inefficient in bandwidth, I, as I just said, doesn't work offline. Links break all the time. So if a, a file moves from machine A to machine B, now you cannot find it on machine B unless there is an explicit pointer uh, redirection. And also problems with control and censorship, uh, the fact that it's being kicked out of the IT world um, and, and that, that the security model, it is definitely better than what we had like decades uh, ago, but we are still only armoring the wire. Like we, we make sure that the data is encrypted when we transfer it, but like we don't really authenticate the data that gets transferred. So this is where uh, IPFS comes in. And IPFS sometimes is also known as the distributed web. And it's a protocol to upgrade the web. And this is very important. It's not a protocol to create an alternative web. It's a protocol that is designed to future-proof the web and to make it more resilient for uh, many, many uh, generations to come. And it's a protocol to make it work offline, to make it work distributed, to make sure that the links are permanent and, and not ephemeral. Uh, to make it safer, faster, and smarter. And how it does this is through changing the location addressing to content addressing. So rather than pointing to um, a location where the content lives, we actually point to its cryptographic fingerprint. Uh, this is um, also known as the content hash or the content identifier. And what this content identifier uh, gives us is the ability to generate a proof that the content, that the bits that I received are indeed the ones that I was looking for in the first place. So in an example similar to before, uh, in the case of location addressing, and if there is a network split, uh, and if the file is on the other side of the network split, then you cannot access it anymore. But with IPFS, if the file is on your side, basically you can just ask any machine and when they deliver the file to you, you can validate that the file is indeed the one you wanted. Um, the, 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 the change here is like before you had to trust a central point of authority to give you the right file, this way you can actually validate it in the client side. And this, uh, this simple construction, and of course, all of the, the, the technology that we built to enable this to happen uh, has created a booming ecosystem of applications. Nowadays, we have applications for all sorts of use cases uh, from productivity, identity, uh, chat applications, data management, social media, and much, much more. And the, the protocol is seeing really a, a large adoption. Some of the recent news, um, and this is 2021 Q1, uh, is that IPFS is getting integrated into the browsers. Uh, in fact, I'm using one of these browsers already. Um, and, um, and thanks to it, uh, I have an IPFS node running. And so if the content is available on IPFS, I can download it directly without having to in install any additional app, the browser that is that work for me. Also, we are seeing the centralized identity uh, through the DID, uh, the centralized identifier standard. Um, and uh, this is also very promising for all sorts of distributed applications that rely on some sort of authentication uh, for interaction between their users. And uh, since like the, the early in the project, but like we continue to see this, is like, it's a very large open source project. Like I, uh, IPFS, uh, Leap Peer to Peer, and all of its components are MIT licensed. And uh, as like multiple thousands of contributors coming every month, reporting bugs, add, uh, adding features, uh, making proposed changes, improvements, doing research on top of it. So it's a very, very vibrant ecosystem. And IPFS ultimately contributes to this whole revolution that is happening, which is the web 3.0. And so for those of you that have been uh, on the web for a while, you might be familiar with, with the evolution from the internet, uh, where we got all connected, to the web 1.0, which is this document viewing platform where we could read static content. 
Then to the web 2.0, which is what we are used today, uh, where we have the read, write, interactive web. So we can have now apps and make collaboration happen, uh, send messages, send documents, and so on. But now there's like this third revolution, the web 3.0. And this is something very new. Uh, it, it's really happening now. And so what, what is it? So the web 3.0 uh, is a combination of three things, actually, not just one. So it's a distributed web. So I already uh, talked about IPFS, how it works offline. It's faster, safer, no need for central point of coordination and gives you this ability to have permanent links so that the content can move and you can access it independent of its location. Then you have the, the blockchain, um, which I'm, I, I'm sure you have heard this term by now. And what this gives us is an environment where we can have permissionless networks that are publicly verifiable and where incentives can be created to align the participation uh, of everyone that is contributing to the network. And then uh, third, last but not the least, is the semantic web. So now, thanks to all of the, the primitives that the distributed web and blockchains enable, we can have a semantic web where programs can understand other programs and we can build better knowledge graphs um, uh, with it. Uh, so this enables uh, a whole new set of what we call open services. And what defines an open service is really the fact that, like, first of all, it's open source, like anyone can audit it, anyone can contribute, anyone can change it. And this is extremely important because in the case of disagreement, like if there are parties that like do not agree with the same values, with the same principles, and they want just to create something different, they are totally allowed to. They can fork and create their own uh, separate network uh, for, for that matter. Um, anyone can join at any point in time and leave. So permissionless entry, also very important. And there is this ability to do programmable agreements. So what this means is like uh, two parties can agree to provide service over time, and this can be publicly verified. Like we don't need uh, external mediators to make sure that parties keep maintain, remain, maintain themselves being honest. We can have this um, being executed through... Uh, a protocol that ensures that the proofs are issued correctly and that the that there is the opportunity for a fair, fair exchange of services that like by for the service provider the, the the right payment is executed right payment or right exchange of value is executed also enables uh, there's new ways to enable access controls over these distributed networks um and, and as i said like that there is a whole new field which is not just cryptography and economics, it's kind of like the merge of the two, which uh, is about creating incentive structures to align participants, optimizing value in a network. And so what the Web3 is, is an evolution of the Web2, but like it's the read, write, trust, and verifiable web. And that can work from anywhere, anytime. And as I said, this is really booming. This chart uh, is publicly available. You can consult the, the survey and it really shows the transformation that is happening in the amount of uh, services that are popping up, building on top of these protocols. And so this is it for the first uh, the introduction here on the first module. Uh, you have four more modules to, to watch, uh, to, to um, complete the core course. I hope to see you on the, those modules. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, see you in the next one.